So it is my privilege to introduce and welcome Reverend Michael Corn today here to Walton. Michael is an author, a journalist, and an Anglican priest. Welcome to Walton, Michael. Good morning, everybody. Now, I, I should make clear you can understand me because I speak English properly. <laughs> and uh, you see, in an Anglican church, you'd all be standing because we just read the gospel. And I would say, I pray I speak in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. But I don't want to shock you. Don't want you to think I'm too Catholic. So it's just <laughs> hello and good morning. And you are a very talented bunch of people, I have to say. I mean, wonderful playing of the cello and the choir and, and, and the children. I mean, I've done enough things with kids and you sit there and they don't say a word and you think, oh my golly, but they were absolutely amazing. And um, <laughs> I should tell, I wasn't going to say this, but whenever I do a baptism, uh, it's always delicate because there are lots of people there who aren't usually in church. You know, let's not kid ourselves. It's like weddings. You know. <laughs> when were you last at church? 1972? And there's a lot of children there because there are siblings with their kids and everything. And, I, and you, want me, you want people to feel comfortable. So I always say, I always tell the same joke. And, or maybe it's a true story. And there's a priest and he's performing a baptism and there are a lot of people with their children. And one child is particularly noisy and the mother picks up the child and goes to leave. And the priest says, no, oh, madam, madam, please don't go. He's not disturbing me. And the mother says, no, but you're disturbing him. <laughs> but disturbing is a good thing in the Christian world. It's good to disturb. That's what Jesus did a lot of. He disturbed people. Now, a bit about me. Um, I'm a, I've, been, I've, I've only been ordained, what, less than five years, actually. I'm an Anglican priest. And uh, my church is just up the road in Burlington, uh, St. Luke's. In, in Burlington. I'm there most Sundays, but uh, it's a real honor to, to be here. I don't know how many Anglican clergy you, you actually have speaking in this church, but I'll, I'll give you a, uh, an outline of what an, an Anglican priest is, what an Anglican clergyman is. And, and I'll illustrate this with a story of a, a little hairdresser's shop, a, a place I'm not that familiar with for obvious reasons, <laughs> but um, a, it's really a barber shop. It's not even a hairdresser, a little barber shop in a back street, and uh, the barber's there, and one day the door opens, ding, ding, the bell, and in comes a Catholic priest, and uh, he cuts the priest's hair, the Catholic priest, he cuts his hair, and at the end, the priest goes to pay, it's only about $15, but the barber says, no, Father, I'm not religious, I'm not Catholic, but I'm huge admiration, for, uh, you know, for the Catholic Church, it's my, it's my gift for you, and the priest says, what a lovely gesture, and he leaves, and the next day, the man goes to open the shop, and there's a bottle of Irish whiskey waiting for him. Oh, isn't that lovely? Isn't that lovely? And a few weeks later, ding, ding, the bell, and the door opens, and there's a, a rabbi, a reform rabbi comes in and, and sits down, and the barber cuts his hair at the end of the, of the hair cutting session. The rabbi goes to pay, and he says, Rabbi, no, I'm not religious, I'm not Jewish, but I have huge admiration for your people, and, 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 and it, it's my gift for you. And the rabbi says, what, what a blessing, what a mitzvah, what a want. Oh, that's so kind of you, thank you. And he leaves, and the next day the man goes to open the shop, and there's a big bag of freshly baked bagels waiting for him. A few weeks later, an Anglican priest comes in and sits down, and he cuts his hair, and at the end, the Anglican priest goes to pay, and he says, no, vicar, father, I'm not, no, really, it's my gift for you. You know, I'm not religious, I'm not Anglican, but... Uh, you know, I know all the work that you do that's marvelous. Please, it's my gift for you. And the Anglican priest says, that, that's such a beautiful thing. Thank you so much. And the next day, the barber goes to open the shop, and there's a long line of Anglican clergy. <laughs> so, there you have uh, 500 years of Anglican polity and theology summed up in one joke that I'm sure my bishop will get to hear about. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to, have their, to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me, for the gospel, will save it. 
giving up your life, physically, literally, metaphorically, symbolically, for the sake of the gospel, living for Jesus. And it's not easy. And anyone who thinks it is hasn't really tried it properly. And thank God most of us will not face anything too direct, violent. <coughs> Some might. But every single day we face challenges. And even what we heard there about the words that we use. How often do we use words and think, why did I say that? Why did I join in that gossip? Why, why, why did I participate in that criticism when I didn't need to and could have done better? And how do I treat people who are suffering and needy and, and broken? Every single day, every moment of every day, we are challenged with the, with the gospel, even if we're not aware of it. And throughout my life, I mean, I can think of all the times, all the stories that the people I've met have inspired me and formed me and made me better. And it's a constant process. It's, it's a permanent revolution of love. It's a permanent revolution of love. If ever, if ever you think, I really, I've got this Christian thing about right. If ever you think that, start again. Because it is a constant revolution of love. That's what being a follower of Jesus really is. I wasn't raised a Christian, I wasn't raised in a Christian family, and I, I, I'm always uncomfortable with the phrase, but I became a Christian, if you like, in 1984, but then I think there was a lot of growth to do. I don't think I really began, became a genuine follower until about 11 years ago, but that's a, another story for another time. But I remember back in 1977 when I left high school, so I'm very, very old. <laughs> And in Britain, we don't graduate from high school. It's not, we don't have big parties, really. You just sort of leave and you go on to whatever, work or university. When, when I left school, very few people went to university. Now it's quite common. But back then, it was a very small percentage. But there was a party at the end of high school where everyone got together. And uh, I was very glad and happy to leave. You only look back years later and realize how good it was. But I was happy to leave, and my, my best friend, my oldest friend, Steve, was best man at, um, at my wedding. Uh, he was there, and lots of other people. And we were chatting and talking about things, and, and most of the people I was at high school with, I've lost contact with. There's a few I still see. But there was one couple, there was one couple at high school, and I say couple because they were always together. I don't remember a time when their names were Jonathan and Angela. And I just don't remember a time when Jonathan and Angela weren't together. And it wasn't one of those annoying teenage things. Oh, look at us, we're a couple. We're the only ones who've ever been a couple. Aren't we amazing? It wasn't like that. It wasn't irritating. They were just always a unit, really. And they were very impressive people. Jonathan was captain of the school rugby team. And he was very good looking. I mean, all the girls in the school were completely in love with him very handsome guy and he was very clever so he was a great athlete he was very good looking and he was very clever and then there was Angela and she again was very sporty she was captain of the school netball team netball is a well, it's not only English but it seems to be a very English sport but she was captain of the school netball team and she was really clever and she was gorgeous as well I mean again every guy every guy I knew Oh, Angela. Oh, Angela. <laughs> and they were together. And here was the annoying thing, though. So they're both really good-looking and really clever and really athletic. At least they could have been nasty, and then you could have disliked them and resented them. But they were really nice as well. They were really nice. And at this party, I didn't see Jonathan, but Angela was chatting to me, and she was explaining to me what she and Jonathan were going to do with their lives. And she was telling me this, and I didn't listen to a word. If I'm going to be honest, I think I was probably trying to look at her legs the whole time. But it was okay because I wasn't a Christian then. You see. <laughs> it's only illegal now. But I just didn't listen. Couldn't be bothered, more concerned with me. And off I went. I went off to a couple of universities and did what I had to do and and I, I, I didn't think about Jonathan and Angela. As I say, my oldest friend, Steve, he was the best man when my wife and I got married in beautiful Whitby, Ontario. And uh, 
A few years later, I got a letter from Steve, and it was before, I suppose the internet was around, but email hadn't really developed at that point, so it was quite a few years ago. And he wrote to me, and he said, what the letter said, uh, said was, are you still coming, I go over every year, I go back to Britain. He said, are you still coming over in July because, do you remember Jonathan and Angela? They've been living abroad, and they've come back, and they're having uh, a party, a reunion party for everyone who was at, at school. And do you want to come? And I thought, it'd be great fun. And he said, if you are coming, um, I've enclosed this little note that they've sent out to everybody they want you to read before, before you arrive. So I looked at the note, and the note said that Jonathan and Angela had been living in Africa. And Angela had been the, uh, a principal of a school. It was a two-room school. It was tiny. And that Jonathan had been an engineer, and that they'd been a terrible fire at the school one day. And um, they'd got everybody out, but then suddenly Angela had realized there was a little boy called Joshua who was in the washroom and was still in, inside this inferno. And that Jonathan had run back in to save him, and this little boy Joshua was fine, and Jonathan was okay, but Jonathan had received some quite bad burns on his upper body and his face. And they wanted people to know this, so they weren't shocked when they saw him. And I read the letter, and I went into my arrogant mode. I thought, uh, well, I've covered wars as a journalist in the Middle East, and I used to report on the troubles in Northern Ireland. I've, I've seen everything. Nothing can shock me. <laughs> and I went over. July and, and the, the day of the, the party came along and I went along to their little apartment and I knocked on the door and Angela opened the door and she was more gorgeous than ever and she said, you're the first one here, Mike, come in. Jonathan would love to see you. And I walked in, it was quite a small apartment and there was a guy sitting there in an armchair but I couldn't recognize him because the scar tissue was so intense it was so profound I just couldn't make out his face and obviously I was staring at him because you know you try to register completely normal reaction it never works my kids always say to me when I'm telling I'm playing a prank on them they say dad we know you're lying your nostrils flare <laughs> apparently my nostrils flare, it's a giveaway. Never play poker. And I suppose I, I just registered shock. And then he spoke, and when he spoke, I hadn't heard his voice in years, but when he spoke, the voice was identical, and I'll never forget what he said. He said, all right, Corin, he said, I know I look a bloody mess, but at least one of us has kept his hair. And I tried to laugh, as you just did, but I suppose laughter and tears come from a similar part of the psyche, and I just, I choked up. And Angela ran up to me and put her arms around me and said, Mike, don't worry, we've both done a lot of crying. Do not worry about that. And then this little boy, little African boy, who was, been there the whole time, but it was like a kitchenette. It wasn't a kitchen, it was like a unit. He was, he, he was tiny, he'd been hiding behind the cupboards, and he ran out, and he jumped on Jonathan's lap and started tickling him, saying, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. And Angela said, this is our new adopted son. His name is Joshua. And then other people began to arrive, and Angela took me aside, and she, she explained the story. And she said, um, we went to Africa after university as missionaries, she said. Not to convert anyone, that's not what we're about. We just went there to try and live the gospel. So I, I was headmistress, I was principal of this little school, and Jonathan worked as an engineer to try and bring clean water directly to the village, because it was dangerous for people to go and collect water. And that's what we did. We were there for some years, and I realized then they were followers of Jesus Christ. Never knew it at school. Maybe it was known by some people. I couldn't be bothered to, to learn or know or hear or listen or see. They had been followers of Jesus Christ, and that's why they went to Africa and devoted their lives to people who needed help. And Angela said to me, she said, you know, 
we'd walk along together and I would see women turn their head because she said, I know how good looking my husband is. And we'd walk along together and almost every woman would sort of turn around and look. And I used to think to myself, I'm so proud of him. I love him so much. She said, now, when we walk along together, everyone turns their head to look for a different reason. And she said, I love him more than ever. I'm more proud of him than ever. They gave everything to follow the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jane Haining was born at the end of the 19th century. Actually, early years of the 20th, I suppose, really when I think about it, um, in Dumfrieshire, Scotland. She was a member of the Church of Scotland, quite similar in a way to the United Church, you know, good Presbyterian roots, and um, she was a member of the Church of Scotland. She was uh, unmarried. I suspect she had never had a boyfriend. I don't know that for sure, but I think it's likely. She worked for the church. She wanted to do all she could for the church. And she was appointed matron of a girls' school of the Scottish Mission in Budapest, Hungary, in 1932. Did you know the Church of Scotland had a mission in Budapest, Hungary, in 1932? Because I didn't. And she worked there in Budapest, Hungary, as matron. She became fluent in Hungarian, which is very, very impressive, because I'm told that the two languages that are virtually impossible to learn are Finnish and Hungarian. They have no root in any other language. Anyway, she learned Hungarian. And she dedicated 12 years of her life to caring and teaching for the little girls in the school who were really just by coincidence, accident, almost entirely Jewish. Budapest had a large Jewish population and this school was largely Jewish. And again, she wasn't there to convert them to the Church of Scotland, or even to the Church of England, which would have been far better. <laughs> she was just there to look after them and teach them and love them. 400 children, aged between six to 16, and they loved her. They loved her and they respected her, as did her colleagues loved and respected her. The best matron we've ever had, they said. By 1940, the Second World War had broken out, but Hungary was in a state of, of relative neutrality. It was allied to the Nazis, but it was because of that, as the same with Bulgaria and Romania and Italy, it was allowed a certain autonomy. It had a fascistic government, but the government wasn't explicitly Nazi. But things were getting worse, and Scottish missionaries, they were British, they were told to leave. If they'd been in Germany, they would have been put into internment camp. But in Hungary, they weren't, but they were told, you need to leave. It's very dangerous. And she said, no. She said, I can't leave. I can't leave my children. They need me more than ever. Then it got much worse. And in March 1944, Nazi Germany occupied Hungary. And at this point, Jews were rounded up, and they were sent to death camps. And she, she knew this. She knew what was happening. She'd been in Hungary for many years. She was getting reports from Poland and elsewhere. She knew what was happening. And that made her all the more insistent that she couldn't leave. I cannot leave my students. I cannot leave my girls. On April the 25th, 1944, two Gestapo men appeared at the mission. They searched Jane's office. They gave her 15 minutes to get her things ready. She was taken first to prison for questioning. Eight charges were laid against her, and she was then deported to Auschwitz, where she became prisoner number 79467. She was reduced to a number, 79467. Her last message to her friends was a postcard asking for food for her girls. And she ended it with the words, there is not much to report here. 
on the way to heaven. There is not much to report here on the way to heaven. She was murdered on July the 17th, 1944. She was 47 years old. Please God, God willing, we will never face anything like that wonderful martyr or even what Jonathan and Angela have to face. But that doesn't mean we don't face challenges as followers of Jesus every moment of every day. The Bible can be as gentle as a watercolor and as powerful as a thunderstorm. It can be taken literally or taken seriously, but not always both. It is a library written over centuries containing poetry and metaphor and history and biography and without discernment, it doesn't always make sense. It has to be, it must be read through the prism, the filter of empathy and the human condition. It must be read and understood through love. And the number of times people say to me, and I, 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 I always wear my collar, I always wear my clerical collar when, when I'm in public. It's amazing the stories, the encounters. It's hardly ever hostility. Very occasionally there's hostility. There's indifference. But often people want to speak to you. They want to ask you questions. When I was first ordained, a few months later, I went back to Britain for my annual trip, and I noticed something. That young, quite rowdy men would often be very affectionate. I'd be outside a pub, I spend too much of my time outside of pubs going in. And these guys say, Oi, oi, father, buy your drink, mate. Come on, father, come with us, buy your drink. And I said, No, no. But it was noticeable. And I said to a friend, a priest friend, I said, I've noticed quite a lot of young, likely lads, you know, young guys. They're really quite warm and affectionate. He said, Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It happens a lot. I said, Why? And he said, They've been in the army or they've been in prison. And the only humanity and love they ever see in those institutions is from the guy with the collar. And I always wear it because I'm trying to be a witness if I can. What it does mean, though, is when I'm driving the car, be a good driver. <laughs> because there are times, you know, when you're not always perfect behind a wheel. But we live the Christian witness. We try to follow Jesus, who who is God made flesh, who comes to the world in human form, not just human form, as a baby, as the most vulnerable creature possible, living in a family under occupation, living in poverty, poor. They were living in a cave, almost certainly in Nazareth, these were cave dwellings, and they have to flee oppression and violence, and they're always in danger. And his mum was a teenager, a teenage Jewish girl, 13, 14 years old. And then, as he grows to manhood, he assembles around him people who are on the margins, not all of them, some of them were just middle class people, but former sex workers and terrorist leaders and a tax collector who is not like the wonderful, because this is being recorded, is it not? Not, not like the wonderful, wonderful people who work for Revenue Canada. <laughs> but tax collectors, were, they were collaborators. The Romans would say, you, you raise as much money as you want. As long as you give us this amount of money, you can steal as much as you like. Clever, the Romans. So the tax collector was someone who worked. He had a Roman bodyguard. He worked for the occupying power. Hated. He was a follower. All of these people in Galilee, which was lawless. Galilee wasn't occupied at, by the Romans. It, it was multicultural. Greeks, Jews, others living together. Banditry. There were bandits on the roads. It was, it was a frightening place to be. Rural unsophisticated, and he assembles all these people around him. And he preaches this incredible story, love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love everyone else in the same way. I mean, it amazes me how many followers of Christ spend so much of their time condemning others, because that is not the Jesus way. He does not condemn. He's not a legalist. He's not a pedant. He's harshest word are for those people who do condemn others. The law is made for us. We're not made for the law. And then I have to say as well, he does have a bit of a, a rough going with those who are very wealthy. 
You know, that young rich man who says, I follow the commandments, I try to be the best person I can be, but what else do I need to do to follow you? And Jesus says, sell everything and give it to the poor. I can imagine him saying, is there anybody else there I could speak to? <laughs> but think about that, because I don't regard myself as rich, but we own a house in Toronto. That means it's rich. We have two cars, and they're both Corollas, but even so, compared to most of the world, we're rich. And if I was told, sell it all and give it to the poor, I wouldn't know what to do. Everything Jesus says is so outside of the norm, outside of the usual purview of what they've known up to that point. Free yourself, liberate yourself, move forward in a great relationship of love with your creator. That's who Jesus is now. Not was then, of course was then, but now because I believe with every fiber of my being that he is here with us right now. In everything we do, holding us, helping us, warming us. Whenever, and as a priest, I do so much of this, I wish I didn't have to in a way, but I deal with people who are going through loss. Last week, last week I attended a funeral of a 32-year-old friend. Very difficult when you deal with that sort of thing, when the, the natural chronology of suffering is broken, someone of that age dies. The, the day before, a friend of mine, 69, but a robust, wonderful man, he died. Two friends died in the space of 48 hours. Whenever I deal with people who are grieving and they say, How does it, why, do they, why do bad things happen to good people? And I, what can I say? What I've learned is generally just shut up and listen. Just be present, be there. But if I am forced, I would say I do believe this is the land of shadows and that real life has yet to begin. But I will also say, God became man. God became person. God became us to suffer with us on a cross in agony, knowing what would happen, not only accepting but embracing what would happen so that anything and everything that happens to us, we know he has been there before. There was that song years ago, uh, What If God Was One Of Us, was one of the lines, What If God Was One? I won't sing, you've suffered enough, but... What if God was one of us? But they missed the whole bloody point. God was one of us. He became one of us to say, I've been there. <coughs> there will be suffering on this earth, these few years you have in these bodies, but there is something more. But I've been there. God was there. I know. I know how you feel. Whoever wants to be a disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. Every time you sacrifice, every time you feel hurt and forgive, every time you say to yourself, I will spend this day to the best of my ability trying to follow the Son of God, that's giving part of your life and living the gospel. That offer was made 2,000 years ago. That hand is outstretched. That glorious hand is outstretched now and will be to the end of time. I know that because God has said it. And God doesn't and cannot lie. Amen.